Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance. From God, our loving Father, and Jesus, our living Redeemer and Savior. Amen. The word of our Lord to which we turn is found in the Old Testament reading, simple words of our Lord God through the prophet, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. These are God's words. Dear gathered people of God, gathered by him, but gathered by the human proclamation of his word, we have been privileged. We have been privileged to be celebrating the 125th anniversary of this Christian congregation. And we've been using the umbrella theme, tell the next generation, as if somehow we gather them before us and we unload something on them and finally not there, now you have it. But think how each and every time we gather for worship, we are telling the next generation. This is so key for us to understand that it happens not by saying, hey, we're this generation, there's that generation, boom, we've dumped it on them now. No, it's by our lives and by our lips, by our testimony that that is passed on, that the next generation is told. Telling the good news is what we do week by week, every week. And the good news of Jesus is as simple as this. Your sins are forgiven you. It's really that simple. Oh yes, we say other things too, but that good news has come to you and to me. And that is of vital importance. You who suffer beneath sin's heavy hand of shame, of guilt, fear of death, certain judgment, there's good news for you and me. Your sins are forgiven you. Jesus Christ came, God's dear Son, in human flesh to bear sin's guilt in his body on the tree of the cross. And he's born it fully. You are healed. You're set free. You are forgiven because of him. Christ bore your sins, every last one of them, Yes, it's true, even though all we like sheep had gone astray, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, and he's bore them faithfully. He shed his holy blood to atone for them. There is and can be no further sacrifice for sin. Christ has done it. It's completed. Your sins are forgiven you. This one says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. What I have to say from God's word this morning circles around two themes. First, through his prophetic mouthpiece, the Lord God declares himself to be the shepherd of his flock of all who in faith call on him. And second, in and across every generation as the message of the good news is told, Christ the good shepherd, God in human flesh, does his shepherding work of gathering, of providing, and of caring for his flock using imperfect men, sinners, every last one of them, whom he himself calls to this task of announcing the good news. May the Holy Spirit bless us as we proceed into his word. Through his prophetic mouthpiece, then the Lord God himself declares to be the shepherd of his flock of all who will call on him. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, he says. And yet, how did God's flock get gathered and ministered to in Old Testament times? Well, that was by priests and prophets. God used real sinners to proclaim and to pass on the good news from generation to generation. But in reality, it was the Lord Christ who searched out and found and gathered his flock to himself. True Israel, you and me. It must never be said, I found him, but rather let the truth be plainly declared. He found you, he found me, and thanks be to God that he did. You see, the Lord God himself does the shepherding, the pastoral work that builds up his flock, but how does he do it? He does it through his word and through his sacraments. Oh no, I left my props in the study. Be right back.
We call these sacraments means of grace because they're conduits through which God's undeserved mercy flows to you and me. And what are they? They're certain physical elements with the promise, God's promise, of forgiveness of sins attached. So in baptism, for example, we have water with the word of God. And in the Lord's Supper, we have the, the dedicated elements with the word of God. And what does this do? This declares forgiveness of sins. They have God's promise. It's not like a new thing that brings forgiveness of sins. No, these deliver the forgiveness of sins earned by Christ on the cross. And you, sinner that you are, you've been reconciled to God. This is great news. He's declared it, so believe it. This forgiveness of sins flows freely to you and me through his completed work of his cross and his cursed death and his glorious resurrection. And we call these sacraments means of grace in the Lutheran Church. I always thought that that didn't connect with me, so maybe it doesn't connect with others because we use the word means in different ways like defining something. They don't define grace. They are conduits of grace. Conduits. What I have here is a piece of PVC conduit. But it doesn't deliver really anything like this. It's intended to have electrical wires inserted through, and then the power passes from one end to the other. It delivers the power. That's what a conduit does. That's what the sacraments do, too. There's no power in plain water. There's no power in bread and wine. But when Jesus' word is attached to it, according to his promise, everything he promised is delivered by Jesus, the good shepherd, not by some magical pastor with extra powers. I don't have them. Trust me. It's Jesus at work. Jesus at work in his church again and again, the good shepherd who promised that he would do the shepherding. So we praise God for that. Oh, by the way, you might find this a good time just to review about the sacraments in your new catechism, just as a reminder that it is the Bible teaching and an orderly arrangement that helps us grasp the meaning of these things fully. Look at it again and again, too. Commercial over. But through it all, don't miss. Don't miss that God desires you and me to hear the good news of the gospel again and again. Your sins are forgiven you. Why isn't it good enough just to hear it once, you say? We need to hear it again and again because of our weakness, because of our continued waywardness of thoughts, of words, and actual deeds too. Jesus says, I myself will be the shepherd of the sheep. Oh, there was a verse in that Old Testament reading which I wouldn't put it past you to be puzzled over. I was too when I read it. Verses 23 and 4. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. Whoa. David. David, the man and king, was long dead. David, the shepherd king, was not the forever shepherd that God spoke of, however. But God had made a promise to David. You can check this out in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God had made a promise that of David's descendants, one of them would sit on God's throne forever and ever. Not just David's throne, God's throne. It's talking about our Lord Jesus Christ who came in great humility to be the true shepherd of the sheep. And when the true shepherd came, he wasn't recognized by all. Oh, no. Notice that gospel reading. Jesus, the good shepherd, is going around finding lost sheep. And the religious leaders, do they say, oh, goody, here's that everlasting shepherd. No. Look at him. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. That's because he was telling them that there was forgiveness and there was a new way to live. And the Pharisees and the scribes, who were they? They're the churchy leaders, the religious guys. They grumble, saying, hmm, this man receives sinners and eats with them. <laughs> they don't recognize their true shepherds, see? So the lost were being found by Jesus. Jesus was preaching his word to them. Sinners were repenting and following him in true faith and hope that he was their true shepherd who had called them 
And Jesus, that good shepherd, had a comforting word for them as well as for you and me. Your sins are forgiven you. So Jesus, the good and true shepherd, brings hope to exiles. That's really the theme in Ezekiel. and don't have time to tell you more about that part of it. But what is that hope? Forgiveness of sins. Eternal life with God and resurrected glorified bodies. He is our good shepherd, always. But now point two takes us to consider this. In and across every generation, Christ the good shepherd, God in human flesh, does his shepherding work of gathering, providing and caring for his flock using imperfect men, sinners all, whom he calls to this task. Now, we will be using the word call numerous ways, but technically we're speaking about calling a pastor like Pastor Ham, who was called 125 years ago. He received some kind of correspondence that said, we want you to come be our pastor. We've called you in this after prayer and deliberation. And so he arrived and came, and they installed him and ordained him on that day, the 12th of September, 1897. I wish I could say and point to a spot, but no, it was about in the parking lot pretty close to the hall there where it had to have taken place. But understand, God doesn't give this task to angels. He could have, I suppose. After all, their name, angel, just simply comes from being announcing. They do announce things, but they're not the gospel proclaimers. God intends for human beings to be that. And sticking to the Bible's terminology, we call those called pastors shepherd. From the Latin, pastor, and not merely preacher. There's a reason for that. I'm sometimes uncomfortable if people say, hey, you're the preacher? Well, actually, I do more than what you think I do. I'm, I'm really concerned about the souls of all God's flock, and so it's more than the Sunday morning what I'm doing now. In fact, in the German, our, our Germanic forefathers had a great name for it. They had lots of great long names, and the, the words kind of stuck together like magnets sometimes. This one was salesorger, meaning soul comforter, soul carer. That's what a shepherd, a pastor was to be. And God uses imperfect men, sinners, whom he calls, he himself calls, to this task. And our epistle reading highlights this for us. St. Paul had no good reason why he should be a proclaimer of Christ, except Christ appeared to him and said, Go, I've got work for you to do now, now that I've forgiven you and shown you the truth. And so he would say this in chapter 1, verse 15, middle of our epistle reading today. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. So Paul is saying, don't elevate me on a pedestal. I'm just a sinner, foremost of sinners, chief of sinners. We have used that phrase and have a hymn with that name. Chief of sinners. Yeah, that's us. Meanwhile, the gospel reading gives us a picture of what happens on the other side of the curtain. Namely, the joy and rejoicing in heaven as God continues through his under-shepherds to get the word out and to convert and call and gather and invite and unite into his church those whom he is gathering. And the good news is, for anyone listening to me, there's still more room in his house. More room indeed. Now, because we're in a unique time, I mean this, we have four vacant calling congregations within, I don't know, probably a 12-mile, 15-mile radius of us in the Altenburg circuit at this time, there's a bit of a heightened awareness as to how this matter of calling a pastor works. A pastor is not a pastor because he graduates from a seminary. I say that with a smile because I'm thinking back to my first week of seminary classes, and we were under the, pa the professor's instruction, going around sharing our names and something about us. And I remember one of the students gave his name and declared he was called by God to be a pastor. And the professor kind of looked with a wry little grin and said, well, we'll see about that. 
You see, there were four years of study and preparation ahead of us before we'd ever find out if we really were going to be called by God, by a congregation, to be a pastor. Now, no one wanted to doubt that the guy had a conviction that that's where God was leading him, but um, we would wait and see about this calling. He did eventually get a call, by the way. But you'll know when you're called by God to be a pastor when a congregation issues that call. And for Reverend Ham, it took place 125 years ago, tomorrow, when he was installed in keeping with that call, which after prayer, he decided, this is where God wants me to do his work. But he always knew he was going to be an under-shepherd, Jesus, our Lord, being the good shepherd. And Jesus made it clear that the proclamation of forgiveness of sins to sinners was and is the highest priority and most important message for us to proclaim. And his voice of mercy offers full and free pardon across every generation, beginning from rebel Adam and deceived Eve as the Lord their God, maker, redeemer, and shepherd, clothes them with garments of skin, which are what? The remnants, the leftovers of a bloody sacrifice pointing to the once for all time sacrifice that the shepherd himself would make on their behalf and on your and my behalf. Yes, indeed. The first man installed who taught and preached the gospel and ministered the sacraments on behalf of the newly founded Zion congregation was Gottfried Diedrich Ham. And I did mention it's also the day that he was ordained into ministry. And they called him pastor, Latin for shepherd. But always he was fully aware, just like any pastor is, I'm not the shepherd, Jesus is. I'm the under shepherd in this place. He was fully aware of that, serving beneath the lordship of Jesus Christ to administer the sacraments and proclaim the gospel, doing the sacraments according to Christ's command for the care and building up of Christ's flock. And Jesus, the good shepherd, had a calling for that under shepherd. There were sheep to tend, and he did it. He would serve us just over five years and then take a call elsewhere. And he completed his ministry years at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Evansville, Indiana, resigning due to ill health in 1933 at the age of 60, dying in July of 1934. The last living recipients of his ministry if I've calculated right, would be 89 years of age or older. Listen to a few words from Luther about this pastoral office. He writes, This ministry will endure and is not to be replaced by another. But the incumbents of this ministry do not abide forever. They die, or they retire, or become incapacitated, or they take a call elsewhere, etc., this necessitates an ever new supply of preachers, pastors, which calls for employment of certain means. The ministry that is the word of God, baptism and holy communion came directly from Christ, but later Christ departed from this earth. Now a new way of sending was instituted, which works through man, but is not of man. We were sent according to this method, according to it, we elect and send others. And we install them in their ministry to preach and to administer the sacraments. This type of sending is also of God and commanded by God. Even though God resorts to our aid and human agency, it is he himself who sends laborers into his harvest field. Therefore, everyone who preaches must realize that he has been sent. That is, he must know that he has been called. You know, in my office I have a file folder. It's kind of skinny but it has the call documents that y'all sent me 32 and a half years ago. And not very often, but every now and then when I'm in that drawer, I have pulled it out and just kind of reassured myself, yeah, I don't do this on my own authority. God has called me here. He's the one who brought me. He must know that he's been called. He dare not venture to sneak into the office Furtively, secretively, and without authorization, it must be done in the open. The sending is done through a man, for example, when a city, a prince, or a congregation calls someone into office, but at that same time, that person is sent by God. So much for Luther's quote as he defines and helps us understand that office. 
So our practice of calling a pastor echoes to a degree what God's word says about Israel's high priests. And I quote from Hebrews now, no one takes this honor upon himself, but only when called by God. The pastor then is called by God, in this case, through the congregation. So now what have we learned? Let's just review. Through his prophetic mouthpiece, God declares himself to be the eternal shepherd of his flock, of all who in faith call upon him. Furthermore, in and across the generations, the Christ the good shepherd, God in human flesh, does his shepherding work through real human beings, sinners all, whom he himself calls to the task. And we remember this with his words, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. Yep, it was a different time when our first pastor was installed. It was a different time, different buildings. 125 years ago, I tried to think this over a little bit, and I realized that Wilbur and Orville Wright hadn't even gotten anything off the ground for any length of time yet. The automobile was still a dream. So was electricity around here. It would be 50 years before some of the members who were the last to get it received electricity in their homes even. What was it like? When you arrived at church in those days, if you walked, the road may have been dusty or muddy or rutted or frozen, depending on the most recent weather. You may have needed to use a boot scraper, such as we have out front, as a reminder of the past and a relic. Wagons and surreys were situated around. Horses would have been tied to posts, their snorting and neighing floating through the air. And while so many things were different, one thing was quite the same. It was sinners who gathered to hear the word of God, calling them to repentance, calling them to believe in Christ's completed work of the cross. Human beings weren't any different then than now. Fears, foibles, sins, crouching at the door, desiring to have them, whether by Satan's wiles, the ways of the sinful world, or our own fleshly draws away from Christ. They, as we, were troubled with sin, with guilt, with shame, longing to be free. And they, like you and me, needed to hear again and again those words, your sins are forgiven you. And the good shepherd has raised up generation after generation, faithful under shepherds, to proclaim his word of reconciliation. And as we continue to tell the good news, hearts and eyes continue to be directed toward Jesus the author and completer of our faith, Jesus, our true good shepherd, so that we can cheerfully and faithfully confess with David the psalmist, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now may God's rich peace guard and preserve your hearts and minds, forgiven hearts and minds, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.